couple, to be honest with you. <laughs> just so, sort of stuff done. Yeah, it's just trying to find the time to get this stuff done, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. How's everything else going? Are you development going well? Yeah, really well. Really, really well. Yeah, definitely can't complain about that. I'll fill you in afterwards on that, yeah, where, how yeah. we go with that. Because we see where you, going where you are brilliant. with it. Good afternoon and welcome to Prism Sounds Creative Conversations. Uh, we uh, hope you're glad you can join us this afternoon. We're here this afternoon with Mike Stevens. Um, and Mike and I will be talking about Mike's uh, illustrious career and how you know how we got into this industry. So good afternoon, Mike. How are you keeping? I'm keeping really well, Jody. How are you? Not too bad, thanks. Not too bad at all. Um, so, Mike. Just to get started, um, let's just fill people in and a bit on your background. So basically, um, you started your career many, many moons ago, um, and you basically were come from a. Sorry, Mark, oh, bear with me a moment because I can actually hear myself in my own headphones at the moment, yeah. and I don't know why. I think someone's got something uh, playing back. Mike sounds a little bit weird through here. Can't hear you now. I can hear you now. Excellent. Okay, I do apologise, Mike, for that. So, basically, um, Mike, you started. You started. Uh, you born in Bristol Beach, and you uh, went to study at. You well, you come from a creative family, um, and you started um, studying at uh, Birmingham City University, uh, which is now Birmingham Conservatoire. And with that in mind, you know, you went on to a delicious career that's worked with many famous um, celebrities and stuff. Um, but tell us how you got into this industry to start with. Now, what, what was it that made you attracted towards the entertainment? Uh, well, I think, you know, from an early age, you know, I came from a musical background, like you said. Uh, my father was a, was a musician. He was a drummer as well as a keyboard player. And so I, I grew up with music around and I always remember you know my younger days back in when he was uh, he you know the sort of late 60s and stuff he was playing in local clubs and things so I sort of got used to that that thing of him going off during the the evenings to play um, at these clubs and um, and then in the summer holidays he would always take us when he was on a summer season with him so I you know I, I got immediately attracted to the to the whole thing, like, like you do, you know, you follow where your parents sort of point you. And when I got into my sort of teen years, I, you know, I really got into music, although I studied classical music to start with. Um, I was always listening to the radio. So, you know, I got inspired by a lot of stuff I heard um, and got into, I, I actually, <laughs> to begin with, I got into prog rock, which is probably <laughs> a strange one, but not really considering I was a classical musician, prog rock sort of fitted my thing when I was young um, and um, yeah we was you know at home we always had instruments around the house so as well as sort of studying you know piano and stuff clarinet I, I, I you know I had guitars there I had other instruments brass instruments so naturally you know I just sort of picked them up and played them um, and by the time I got to my college years you know uh, I'd started doing stuff at college, although it was a classical college, you know, with local bands and stuff. And I was playing guitar and all the rest of it. So it was a natural progression when I finished there to, to go into that side of the, the business, really. OK, fantastic. So, you know, you st you ended up um, studying at Birmingham City University and then at what is now known as Birmingham Conservatoire. We'll come on to yeah. that in a moment. So you, uh, you've you now got an honorary fellowship, which I was lucky enough to attend. Um, and Julian Lloyd Webber gave you that fellowship. <laughs> um, but when you left university, I, you know, you, uh, and you went on from there. Um, well, actually, while you were at university, I think you uh, undertook um, some conducting um, at a local village to our main offices in Hadner, um, in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how, how did that come about? Uh, well, I think I've mentioned, you know, I picked up instruments when I was younger. Um, and one of the things that I picked up, which my dad used to conduct and have a local brass band at his college where he worked. And um, I used to play in it. And um, I kind of got hooked playing in this brass band. So 
when I got to college, when, before I went to Birmingham, I went to I was at Cambridge Tech doing A levels, and there was a local band, and you know I started playing with them, and um, then I started doing a bit of conducting with them, and it was um, something that I've been brought up with, and it was just great fun, you know. Brass bands are something that that are very English, and um, that they're, they're really great things to be involved with. I've, I've always had a little bit of a, a thing for it, actually, and um, so it was a natural thing to do. And again, it was sort of the first introduction to sort of working with other musicians, really. Even though there were, you know, brass seventy plus year old brass players who probably didn't listen to a word I said, I kind of got into that. Thing and, and I sort of found that I quite enjoyed that rapport with musicians. You know, that was that was the thing I gained most from it. Okay. And then, you know, after you finished at university, um, and uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but then you started uh, gigging, yeah. and I believe you ended <coughs> up um, being a legendary Butlins um, <laughs> <laughs> representative, um, and then you ended up touring around the Caribbean on tour sh- um, uh, cruise ships. Yeah, I mean, again, back in in those days, you know, live music was different th- than it than it is now. And you know, you could get you could make a living um, in in a lot of these funny, weird places. And and Butlins was was somewhere that was, you know, had live acts, it had live things going on. And and you know, it wasn't in the days when you had a lot of backing track stuff. So they'd always have a live band. And um, I took a band of youngsters as we were then. Um, to uh, we, we got offered a, a, a gig at um, Butlin Skegness, and, and so I took a band of college guys, all very green, not know what we were doing, to Butlin's, and it was oh my god, you know, there were you know, we were accompanying magicians and jugglers and singers, and you name it, it was it was crazy introduction. And they'd throw bits of music in front of you, and, and you'd have to you know, you'd play it straight away. Um, or they get very upset with you. So again, although as mad as it sounds, it was a great grounding for that. And, and also we used to do a lot of, we started doing covers as the band. We were a six piece. And <clears throat> so what we we do with that is, you know, we take the, the well-known songs in the charts and we'd learn them and play them. Um, and of course, again, it was a great way to actually get into the mechanics of songs and to work out how to perform things live. Um, again, I had, I didn't, I just always went with whatever came along, not really realizing the benefit of it at the time. It, you know, you would be, be hard to see the benefit, but when I look back, it was a really great grounding and, and I feel quite privileged to have had that because that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, the same as, you know, cruise ships, you know, after we've done that, you know, again, you have the, the cabaret stuff on the, on the cruise ships and they need, they need live bands. So I took the guys, you know, we were all young and, and we cruised around the Caribbean and we went down to South Africa and we went to Mauritius and we spent about six months, you know, in this, having this incredible time uh, playing music. And it was like, wow, this is not bad. This is not a bad way to, to earn music, to, to earn a living. Um, but, you know, after a while, that does become quite a tough thing to do. Uh, and, and you, you know, I loved it, but, you know, I needed to move on. And after those early years, you know, it was like, it's as great, but it's not really going anywhere. I need to move on. So right. that's what I did. Okay. So when you, when you moved on, I think, you know, it, you went from you, you, your career just followed an upward trajectory really. Cause you know, as I understand it, you uh, finished on the the cruise ships and the, that touring element, and then you decided that actually you wanted to go down the session musician route. Um, and was you? Would, am I correct in that? And did you move? I think you moved yeah. to London. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like you decide. You kind of go where it takes you. I mean, I was definitely tired of the, doing the sort of cover stuff and all that. And I, but, but I got a chance with one of the the bands I was working to to be part of the a house band at the uh, Hammersmith Palais. And um, that sort of got me into London. And that was really what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into London. And then I could start exploring, you know, getting into the music business for proper, which is what I wanted to do. So 
I went there, spent a couple of years again playing covers, um, singing, you know, Karma, Karma, Chameleon, and you name it. Um, George Michael songs, whatever. Um, <laughs> but underneath, you know, I, I was developing as an artist and a, as a sax player, really. And um, I'd, I'd come back from one of my cruises from America with this lovely bit of gear called a Porter Studio, which um, even you'll remember probably. But oh, yeah. <laughs> a four-track cassette machine. But it was a revolution back then because you could multi-track on this thing that everyone could afford. So I got loads of ideas at the time, and um, I also wanted to sort of, you know, go and see, you know, get into the music business proper. And again, coming off <clears throat> Butlins or whatever is not a great calling card, but I, I could make my own music properly. So I, made, I, I sort of demoed up a, a sax album at that time, a sort of smooth jazz type thing, went around lots of people, and lo and behold, um, I managed to get a deal. It, it was at a time, late 80s, when the kind of soul music was, was big and soul instrumental music was big. Uh, I got onto a little label who were doing this and then all of a sudden RCA came in. And before I knew it, I'd got a major label deal. Um, late 80s. And, and, and wow. And, and, and at that time, I was then, you know, I was determined to get into session work and I was getting work. I would kind of, put myself into various places and I started to work for a lot of producers as a as a session guy playing sax and guitar was my thing but but then I got more into arrangement and, and a bit of production stuff with them so and then I got a bit of success with various bands that I that I I sort of got involved with, or artists that had hits and and basically it was me playing and um, um, so yeah, I mean, it all kind of happened at a similar time, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and then with, with the solo career, I, you know, I got into touring because they, you know, the record company wanted me to get out, promote the album, soul kind of music. So I ended up supporting, you know, Dionne Warwick, The, the Temptations I did a great tour with, um, Barry White, you know, loads of these people, uh, you know, I would I would do support stuff, one of which was um, uh, Bill Withers, whom I did a three week tour with. And um, th that was a fortuitous one because he, he came over from America, um, but he didn't have a band with him. His band couldn't make it for whatever reason. And my my management phoned me and said, we've got you on the support for Bill Withers. Great. And they said, um, but Bill can't bring his band. So he's asking, would you guys and your band play for him as well as doing your set? Which was like, wow. So I said, yes. <laughs> um, again, baptism of fire. He came over um, and we did a three week tour with him, which was absolutely brilliant. You know, what a legend. And um yeah, that again was my first, you know, although I'd had my own bands, that was my first real foray into, you know, being in charge of the music, being in charge of the, the situation, being a, an MD, music director in that way. Um, I was pretty green to it. And, you know, I made a few mistakes and he let me know about them um, <laughs> in no uncertain terms. Um, and, uh, you know, that was the that was the sort of start of, of that sort of thing. Um, I just naturally got into it. that. It wasn't something that I, that I looked for. It just happened. But it gave me a lot of sort of kudos out there. It certainly put my name out there. Super. Well, basically, Mike, this is kind of where uh, I kind of came in because, you know, you gave me my first yeah, break yeah. kindly. Thank you very much in the industry back in the early 90s. So um, for those of you who are watching, you know, I worked for Mike um, for a few years. Um, before heading up to Manchester to study uh, audio engineering at Salford. And well, that, that was when we were doing, when I was also doing a lot of remixing at that yeah. stage. I had a studio at home and um, there was this lad down the road, this young <laughs> lad who was into <laughs> into engineering. And, and, and I think you just asked if you could come and sort of make the tea and watch what was happening. So uh, and, and it, it's still from there. 
And I think the thing about it is it's still probably one of the best groundings people can get is making the tea, you know, because you watch what everybody else is doing and yeah. you learn your trade. Um, but to that end, I've just got something to share with you because I was digging yeah. through my archives. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm just going to turn my background off for a moment to share with you. Now, this is a blast from the past for you. This is, this is the local newspaper oh, from 1993. <laughs> With God. your ADATs and your Alan the Heath console, yeah, and your original that. sax. But yeah. remember, Mike, could it be magic? Oh, <laughs> because... what, what a title! That's, <laughs> I think that I think I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you like you say, you did a lot of remix work, and some of the stuff you were. Oh, let's put the background back on. Um, some of the stuff that you were responsible for was things like Shaggy and Boombastic, and you did stuff yeah. for Eternal and Awesome 3, Dream Frequency, Mosaic, and we did stuff for Positiva, City B, XL. But one day you get a phone call, and mm. it's somebody saying, we'd love you to come and uh, be part of the band, um, and now the musical director, um, for some boy band called Take That. <laughs> so yeah, it was a... A random call out of the blue, 1992, end of 92. I think it was in 92. Um, yeah, I got a call. <clears throat> Hi. Um, what it was is at the time, the, the guys were working the studio a lot. They'd had a band, but it hadn't worked out. They, they kind of, it, it just was all wrong, these guys that they got. So they they got rid of them and they, they weren't big then. They were just starting out. They'd had the second single or something. And a friend of mine who was working in the studio knew I did live work and he'd sort of blagged his way into saying, you know, they were looking for a band. He said, well, oh, I, can, I, I know a, a band. I can get some stuff together. And he phoned me up and said, Mike, Mike, I've got this boy band um, who are doing some gigs um, and uh, they need a band. I said, oh, great. He said, Don't, I've told them I, I can do it. I was like, really? Because I knew he couldn't. And, mm. and he said, so that's why I phoned you. And um, he said, what do you think? Can we do something? So I was like, yeah, of course. He was kind of officially the MD then. Um, so I got together um, some musicians for him. I got Paul Turner at Milton McDonald, who's still doing it, um, and, and a few others. And, yeah, we put it together. And at this time, they hadn't really hit big, big. They were sort of, you know, known. But by the time we, we, you know, we had a tour arranged for the following March in 93, there was a sudden surge and they suddenly went massive. And it was amazing how quick it happened. And by the time we got to the tour, um, the single I remember we were doing, uh, they were doing and we were rehearsing for the, for the tour. But the single that came out was Prey and it went straight to number one. It's their first number one. So there we were with the number one band in the country, you know, from like absolutely nowhere. I mean, you know, it's like, what the hell happened here? I remember rehearsing with them. We were, we were sent away to some farm in Wales or somewhere, all hidden away because by that time they, you know, the, you know, the, the, the fans were already starting and, and were following them everywhere. So we were hidden away in a place in Wales and we had in a farm in the middle of nowhere. And that's where we, we, where we rehearsed. Um, oh, I remember uh, that farm well because yeah. I remember before you guys got there, Hugh yeah. and I, who was, for those that you don't know, Mike used to have an engineer called Huey. We yeah. ended up taking all the gear from the rehearsal studios down to that farm yeah. in Wales. And even when we got there, where we thought nobody's going to know where this is, there was always a couple of fans outside the gates. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so there always was. It started, it started back then with the fans. I mean, you know, take that fans are, are incredible. You know, I've never known anything like it. And I've played with a lot of pe people and a lot of different artists. But, you know, they're so loyal. They're so, you know, uh, into what the band do. They follow them. And, you know, it was the same at the beginning as it is now. You know, it's yeah. no different. It's just we're all older. Yeah, <laughs> we are. That's for sure. Definitely. <laughs> So, so obviously, you know, that went on for a few years and then obviously 1996 came and it was, you know, the NHS were put on standby because of hearts broken because yeah, the band yeah. broke up. Um, well, we had a fantastic three years touring with them. We went everywhere and it was wonderful and, you know, incredible stories, 
going around Europe, you know, in buses being followed by 50 cars full of fans from everywhere and looking at hotels in, I remember looking at outside the hotel room in Sweden and seeing a bus stop and it was snowing and there were fans asleep, huddled up in this bus stop, you know, and there was snow everywhere. Um, all sorts of fantastic things. And we hit the end of 95 uh, and we were rehearsing for a tour with them. And that's when Robbie left. I remember the being in rehearsals and there was, was a little bit of something, you know, there between them. Robbie was, was such a different character to the other four, you know, he kind of, you could see he was a maverick. He wanted to do his own thing. And it, it, it obviously reached ahead and it had been tension. And on the, on the tour, literally one Thursday, I think it was, he, he kind of left. He just left the rehearsals. And we were about a week or so away from, from touring. And, you know, what's happened? Oh, he's left. And it was like, oh, you know, he's, he, he's, you know, he does that sort of thing. He'll be fine. He'll be back on Monday. Um, you know, we'll just rehearse the weekend. And we, we got to the Monday and he wasn't back. Yeah. Um, and by this time, it was all over the papers and, you know, he'd gone. And that was a big thing for the guys. We had to get together that next tour, you know, with with four of them with about a week to go. And we'd rehearsed for God knows how long with five. You know, his songs had to be put to other people. And just the, the trauma of the whole thing, you know, he'd gone and um you know for the for the guys you know they they'd been together since what 91 or a lot of years and suddenly you know he he's not there um and we did the tour and it actually went really well but i think there was a feeling you know when we got into the end of that tour that <clears throat> it just didn't feel right at that point and um next thing we knew um was the famous you know um take that is no more um, <laughs> speech, and um, yeah. that was that, and 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 it was like, oh, okay, so that that was a brilliant time. That's finished. I mean, for me, it was it was great because from then on, right through the, the rest of the nineties into the two thousands, you know, I, I was getting asked to to MD so many artists, and it was it was wonderful. You know, I, I got so many opportunities, and it was really it set me up, yeah. and. Um, I went on from there to to work with so many so many different artists, and it was all because you know the, the take that thing had, had put me there. And at the time, you know, they were a massive boy band, and they were looking for MDs that could do that sort of thing. And of course, you know, I'd had the experience and and everything to uh, uh, you know have done it at the level that we did it. So you know, it was fantastic. Just went on from there, really. Well, you know, you've you've moved. Obviously, we had this large expanse of gap between take that breaking up and then reforming. But there, mm -hmm. there's a whole wealth of you know stuff that you've been involved with outside yeah. of take that. You know, you've you've got like you say the extra ELO touring with Jeff Lynne, musical yeah, director yeah. for Jeff Lynne, um, Annie Lennox, and and actually let's talk about that for a, a little while because you were um, nominated for a Grammy for your work with Annie Lennox. Um, and you know you 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 co it well, you co produced you co wrote um, you know if I'm if I'm saying anything wrong here Mike do correct well, no, me I'm, but <laughs> um, you're you're nearly right <laughs> okay let you you, you explain yeah. a little bit about it. yeah no I mean I met Annie in two thousand and two um, again I'd been working with so many people she was looking to go on the road for the first time as a solo artist believe it or not since the Eurythmics had <laughs> split in ninety uh, in Gosh, 1990, I think it was. She'd had a couple of massive albums. Uh, she was big all over the world, but she hadn't toured properly. And they hit, uh, we hit um, 2002 and she she had another album and, and she wanted to tour it. So I got a call and went to meet her. Um, got on great. And there we were, you know, I, I was MDing Annie, who I was, you know, big hero of mine, uh, heroine, you know, of mine. She, she was just in, incredible. So, but, but we, we got on really well. Um, and we, we we're very similar in a lot of ways. You know, I, I, I really admire her. She's an incredible woman, incredible songwriter, singer. And, you know, she really touches the parts of the heart that other people can't reach. You know, she's 
an emotional blockbuster of an artist. And I really responded to that. And um, as well as, you know, we, we then we toured 2003, four with Sting and all sorts of wonderful things then. But creatively, she was a bit of a, an impasse. She'd done these albums and she basically started because she knew I, you know, I did a lot of studio stuff. And um, she asked me to do a little bit of stuff with her. You know, can, can I come in and I've got work on some ideas? And we did. And we got on fantastically well. And um, we worked on an album <clears throat> in 2006, which ended up being called Songs of Mass Destruction, which essentially she wrote and we demoed it all in my studio. Right. Um, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, and then Glenn Ballard produced it in America, the, the album. But, um, you know, I I sort of had a production credit on there and I had a lot to do with that. Um, and, and various stuff that we'd done ended up on the album. But we then started, you know, in earnest, she, she then stuck with me, really. And after that, we worked pretty much, even right up to now, um, in, in any studio stuff she's done, we've done together. Uh, in terms of the writing, I also have that, I, I, although I have actually written, <laughs> I think, something with her, I think it was one song. Annie's a, a solo writer. Right, Okay. Um, and so I apologise for that. I got that. Bit no, no, no. She, she, she's. Um, I always see, see myself as a, a facilitator, if you right. like. Um, and 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 I think anybody that works with Annie would say that is that she's so it's such a natural sort of thing with her. The the trick is to be able to get what she's trying to get out and put it onto tape or whatever it happens to be um, to capture that because she's very instinctive and working in a studio environment is, I've got an idea. You know, it's almost, you know, she's, she's tunnel vision, straight to the piano, play. Oh, I'm going to sing this. And then, and, and she's, and you just got to chase her around <laughs> right. to keep up with it. And then the way we would work would, would be like that. We'd be very much, pretty much everything would come from her and the piano because she's a really good piano player. And that's where she writes all her stuff. Um, and then once we got that instant kind of stuff from the music, we could then sit down and then really think about. And that's where, you know, I would come into my own a lot because we'd have to craft the music, how we were going to, what we were going to do with that, what we we're going to add to it, you know. Um, and we did, a, a, um, with the first full album I did with her back in 2010, it was called A Christmas Cornucopia which was a Christmas album, but um, a totally original sounding and typical Annie album in that, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a very gothic sounding album. It's, it's not your, your total happy Christmassy thing. Um, and I suggest a lot of people should go and listen to it, actually, because they're re-releasing it this year, 2020, right. um, in a new form um, with a new track, some remastering. Um, fantastic it's so totally annie really it, it it shows you what she's all about because she can bring something to 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 music and these traditional songs she brings a fantastic um thing into it but but we worked on that album and yeah, it was top 10 um both sides of the atlantic sold really well and we continued on i did i did various things with her for the annie lennox collection we did um we had a Top 40 uh, with Shining Light. Um, we did various other things through those years. And then in 2015, uh, 2014, we did another album together, which was Nostalgia, which is a lot of songs from um, the past that she loved, particularly sort of jazzy 50 standard things. And that was the album which was nominated for a Grammy, um, right. which had a track called I, I Put a Spell on You on. Uh, which was the lead uh, track on Fifty Shades of Grey. So oh, it's the okay. opening track on that movie. And it, it was a big, a big track. Um, and uh, again, as we did, as I did, did with her, you know, it, it's all done. Everything we, we do, we do in my, my studio, my small little studio. She's not into big spaces. She's not into big grand things. She likes the, comfort of a small 
non-intimidating kind of place, which is yeah. what brings the best. And, you know, there was no pushing to get this, that and the other. You know, she would come whenever we work. She comes in have a cup of coffee. Maybe we do something. Maybe we don't. You know, it, it's a very much about creating the, the that that space for her. And, um, and 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 that's it's been an ongoing thing for you. I mean, she's a very, very dear and close friend of mine as well. You know, um, she's um, and I really admire her and and and, you know, she's an incredible natural musician creative force um uh, i've got nothing but wonderful things to say about her really she's she really is a proper icon you mentioned about your studio there and i know it's something that you you were keen to talk about and just just while we're on this subject if anybody who's watching would like to have any questions please put them in the chat either on youtube or facebook and we can ask mike your questions so please don't be afraid to ask any questions that you may have um, but Mike, you, you're keen to, uh, you know, we, we spoke before this, you're keen to have a chat about um, your studio work yeah. and, 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 and the equipment that you use. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, even went back when, you, the, the, when I worked for you, you know, it was always that homely environment yeah, it yeah. was you know um i remember your 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 sound booth was in the garage and we adapted <laughs> yeah, the garage into a sound booth um yeah. uh, but it, people were always welcome and you know yeah, i yeah. think you know i've been to your studio recently and you know it does have that homely feel it's mm. you know it's welcoming you know you, you say about annie but do you think that's important for a lot of the people that you work with yeah absolutely um i did a a Mark Armand album, um, 2017, um, which again, we did all here. And it was a 60s, quite an orchestral sounding album, but it was all done here. Um, even the strings in small spaces were, were done here, doubling up and all sorts of things we did. But, you know, Mark's another artist who he needs to feel comfortable to perform. And, you know, the, the homely element of it works a treat you know he 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 was another one he felt perfectly at home here and again there was no pushing you know vocally uh, if he felt like singing great you know it's not like sometimes even after big artists in big studios can feel intimidated or clock watching you know that sort of stuff can affect them and sometimes a big space can affect an artist or anybody even a you know, even a session musician, you're sitting, there's something intimidating about a, a massive 96 channel SSL G series desk, which makes you go, I better not get this wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a fly, how many, whew, first take, oh, it didn't do, you know, you can, you can get very intimidated in those spaces um, with lots of other people around. And, you know, again, with a lot of the artists I work with, it's one just the two of you know the two of us. I very much do most of the instruments myself. I'll bring people in if I need to, but you know guitars and you know we, we can get the whole thing going. And I find much better results with artists in particular in that environment. And it's all for me. It's all about you know I, I do see pr producing and production is a funny thing because you know th there are different types. There are producers that that you hire that basically you hire them and what they bring to give to your artist and it gives them a sound and it gives them a direction which maybe they haven't got i'm very much the other way in so much that i like to work with an artist that's got something that i want to bring out and i want it to be about them and i want the sound of the music to represent them not me um because that to me it's not for everybody because certain artists don't want that but for me, the essence of the artist is, is incredibly important. So that's why I use the word sort of facilitator to a certain extent, because a lot of artists don't really know, don't really know how to do that. You, you know, there's an art to, to saying, you know, you know, some artists want to work on parts and, and, and sounds, you know, in the minutiae of everything. Oh, I'll drop that in. And I'll do this. Whereas I find certain artists, particularly instinctive ones, you get them at the right moment, then they're, they're most chilled you, and you take those moments. 
and that is usually where you'll find the magic you know rather right. than getting into over you know too much mechanics of it and again you know with um with equipment you know this especially these days there's so much great stuff out there i mean you you know as we know you can make an album on garage band and it's going to sound great you know if yeah. you want to um and people sometimes feel they have to spend a fortune on a, a you know a, a mac system tower um or whatever but as you know um that's not really where the sound comes from you know you need to have decent hardware and you need a computer with a basic program and and you can do just as well on a garage band as you can do on a pro tools hd system um in fact in some ways the simpler the better for me because you know you don't want to get too bogged down with the technical side of it mm. um and it's very I, easy for that to happen i think that's one of the things that i was i'm going to be honest i was quite surprised that when i came to a studio it's it's a fantastically well-equipped studio mm. but compared to what you used to have so you had an Allen mm. heat save series console mm. you yeah, had yeah, yeah. ADAT machines and I remember spending ages striping the tapes and yeah, not much yeah. what else and racks of gear and you know I, I got the impression that you're not that it's simplified is the wrong word but it's almost like a stripped down studio so you're focusing yeah. on the key elements that you need to get the creative um, the creative results that you're looking for yeah. um, you know, how, how has the change in technology affected you? You know, it, 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 has, has it made your workflow better? Has it made you more creative? Oh, 100%. Um, uh, you know, I'm much more creative with the way te technology is now than I used to be because you, you, you did used to get bogged down in it. And I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I love the sound of, um, you know, the good old B16 and, and, um, and all that, you know, it sounded wonderful. But now that nowadays with with computers and you know with the software you know replications of uh, of of stuff you know it sounds fantastic and, and and what I want you know I have my my keyboard my guitars my sax everything around me I, I really want to just be able to to put it down as quick as possible and then worry about it later whatever and it's made me much more creative I mean I enjoy technology and I enjoy what um you know a lot of the new um daws can bring and the, the the new technologies that come along with it uh, a lot of the so new software you know it's it's not just creatively good but it, it's fun to use and um mm. you know i i love that and, and you know musically the, uh, the, you know the the synth emulations and the you know, all that stuff. It, it's all fantastic to me. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I am old school in, in, in that's where I come from. But I think technology's fantastic. And for me personally, it, it really helps to make me more creative. When I get to the end of a situation, you know, of recording, you know, I can I can go and I can find some fantastic plugins to make it sound the way I want it to sound. And if I want it to sound like uh, a 1970s recording as far as i'm concerned i can get pretty close certainly close enough for the people that are listening to the music i make there will be people out there that will say oh no but you know it's just not but you know that's a small minority and um that's they're entitled to that and they're probably right in their own way but you know where do you draw the line at the end of the day how important is that when you talking about making music and being creative it, you know there's a point where that that level of you know there are just aren't that many people that can hear the difference i'd be yeah. amazed i could put a lot of great musicians in and give them two recordings of something one that was done analog and one that's using digital with analog software i'm telling you there'd be a very small percentage that would know the difference mm -hmm. And with, with that in mind, you know, you talk about some of the artists that you've worked with over the years. So, you know, you work with Annie, you work with Take That Live, you work with ELO Live, you know, you, you, you've got a wealth of knowledge, both from producing, songwriting, your own material as well, and, and, and touring. You know, when you're capturing a performance by an artist, you know, like mm. the people that you've worked with in your own studio, you know, is it? do you think it's important to have 
a neutral, transparent, accurate sort of front end so that you're capturing in its entirety the performance of the artist so that you can adapt it as you see fit? Um, I do to a certain extent, but I do think, uh, I think front end is very important, you know, to add a certain analogness being the mic. I mean, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm still a firm believer in, in good vintage mics. Mm. I think they add something to a performance I, and, and good front end analog hardware, you know, mic pre's, you know, I think that's important. Now you can do that digitally and you can do it really well. But if I go to any point to analog, it's that front end that I still feel adds and it does add a certain magic to a vocal. Yeah. Uh, you want a certain transparency, but you, you know, you, there's a sort of body that you can get to a vocal or a instrument. If you put it through, you know, you know, a, a, a focus, right producer pack, for instance, from the, you know, one of the old ones or something, which yeah. I used to use a lot with Annie back. I had one, you know, an earlier, an eighties one anyway. And, um, you know, and it just used to do something. I mean, and, you know, I've got an, I've got an Avalon, uh, the, um, 737, which is great for front end as well. You know, I know they do really good emulations of it, but it's the one place where I would, I mean, I know I said about technology and I'm still sticking to that, but you've asked me the one place where I think probably a little bit of that analog hardware is, is good. And it, that's where it is. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be loads and loads, one small unit and a really good old mic and you're away. You, you can use that mic on, you know, everything. P people get sometimes bogged down with mic choices. A good vintage 414 or a TLM 103, which are similar sort of priced mics, good old versions will sound good on just about every. If you've got those two mics, there's not a lot you can't record. Right. So basically, you're, you, you know, from a front end perspective, you're using you're capturing the mic preamp. And this is one thing I would probably drive upon is that you you use a, you you want to capture the sound of the mic pre, the microphone and the artist, because yeah. those are creative decisions. And then when you're trying to put it into the digital domain, that's got to be an accurate decision, you know, yeah. and they're two different elements. And understanding the difference between the two is vitally important yeah. because, yeah. you know, you don't want something that's going to alter what that mic pre or that artist is going to sound like unless Absolutely. you've made that decision. Totally. But I mean, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, I don't think dig, digital these days massively changes that as long as you've, mm. you've got a good analog signal going in. Um, uh, the perception is very small of, of, of a difference. I mean, as I said, I, I, it, it doesn't bother me if I get a good analog front end going into my computer. That, that's, that sounds great. OK, if you put it onto a tape, it, it will sound a bit different. But at the end of the day, for me, it's more important that the um, the front end comes from the mic and the quality. Mm. You know, also, the quality of the instruments when you're recording instruments. You know, people sometimes forget that, but you know, acoustic guitar is probably one of the the most used things on record ever, and more than ever at the moment. You know, good quality instrument, old, you know, warm sounding acoustics. You can't beat that, and and that's just as important to me. Old synths, they still sound great. Yeah, I was I was watching a video last night actually, funny enough, with Thomas Dolby, and uh, they mm. brought out. He, I, I don't know if it was Tomorrow's World or what it was. He was look he was on, but it, he said uh, he was talking about a Casio VL tone, and I was <laughs> thinking, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, okay. You know, but it's like you say, you know, back in the day, you had these four track tape machines that you mm. got started with and you'd bounce the tracks down. And it's just an evolutionary process. Now, obviously, yeah. we've got people watching today who are probably just starting out and, you know, yeah. they want some advice on where you would say, focus your attention in this area when it comes to purchasing. Well, you know, if you were starting out again, Mike, and you were trying to point somebody in the right direction as to what to look to buy, what would you say? Um, simple, but quality. Right. Now I use the, the word quality again, because 
you know, quality's improved vastly. And, you know, there's a lot of fantastic companies making much cheaper, great quality stuff. Don't get me wrong. Um, than there used to be uh, when it was difficult to, to do that. But um, a simple, keep it simple. You know, don't think that you've got to spend, you know, you've got to have masses of gear and you've got to have the top of the range Mac, you know, with with this, that and the other all over it. Uh, you don't start simple. A lot of people use logic, um, even garage bands, as I've said, on a on a computer. Again, you don't need a massive computer these days to run software. I mean, my software of choice at the moment is Persona Studio One, which I, I've been using in the last few years. I, I've always been a Pro Tools guy, um, but I really love their Studio One. It's it, I, I love it because I feel it's a very creative tool. And it's becoming more creative. What, the, the, what you can do with it is fantastic. It's it, and it's fairly simple, and it's also, you know, it, it runs very lean. Another a good thing. So it means you don't have to have a massive, powerful computer. You can run from a laptop, um, which is you know four or five years old easily, um, and and get more than you'll ever need um, uh, from the the power aspect of it. So. That would be my thing. I would say invest in um, uh, a great mic, and, and I, I say that because it's not just for vocals; it's for for you know guitars, whatever, and a good preamp. Right. Um, and there are lots of good preamps. It doesn't have to be necessarily have to be a vintage. I love vintage, but it doesn't have to be in that respect. Um, and you're away. What you know? What more do you need, really, uh, at this stage? The a lot of the programs, again, like Studio One, for example, they all do this. But, you know, their onboard software is, is fantastic. It covers every, you know, you don't need to even buy any software if you, you know, if you want to learn compression, compressors. You know, we all have hundreds and hundreds. We all look at our, our little uh, thing on the side there and are a bit overwhelmed with what we're going to pick. But the, the truth is that we probably only use 15 or 20 plugins you know all the time mm -hmm. but um for a, a beginner or, or a, somebody in the early stages you know look at any of these you know logic has a fantastic uh, array of instruments as well um that, that, that these, these are the th these are the, the the things to do but again don't don't get carried away keep keep it simple right and make sure that the creativity uh, it, that you don't get bogged down with the technology um, and it, it stops the creativity. Um, we've got a quick question while you've been mentioned about preamps. You know, um, Sebastian is asking, what preamps do you like? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm, in terms of the uh, the analog side of things, I'm still a big fan of Focusrite preamps. I like the, I mean, I, I tend to use the all-in-one um, boxes like the Focusrite producer pack and my Avalon 737, which are the, my two favourites. They're a bit more expensive. You know, they're not cheap to buy, but um, they're my favourite front ends. Uh, and again, you know, I will use um, software front end as well quite happily. But they're, they're the ones that I, they're the ones that I pick. Okay. So they're both not cheap ones, but... We've got about 10 minutes left, Mike, so I just want to reiterate, thank you, Sebastian, for that question. Um, if you've got any other questions, please do ask them. Um, but like I say, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, Mike, obviously, a lot of the work that you have undertaken is in your actual home studio, yeah, your yeah. facility. Um, but when would you go to a larger scale facility, so the likes of Abbey Road or Metropolis? Now, I know you've recently been, as you mentioned earlier, doing the, the mastering for this Annie album that's yeah. coming out at Christmas at Abbey Road, um, and you've been working with the guys down there. But, you know, when do you find that crossover between the facility that you have and then needing the extra, the, um, a large scale facility? Well, I mean, it purely and simply for me, it's to do with size. So if I'm needing to, to record a big string or orchestral section, that's for me is the space is important, like an Abbey Road or um, something like that, or, or, or drums. So for instance, I don't record drums here, although I could do. Um, I, I, 
I don't do that. So that's what I use other spaces for. And, uh, you know, a lot of lot of times, you know, particularly with drums, you know, the space is the main is the main aspect of it. I know that, you know, talking of um, one of my other recent <laughs> people, which is Jeff Lynn, who I've been with ELO for a lot, about seven years now, I suppose, on the road. You know, I learned a lot from Jeff. Um, I've watched Jeff a lot in the studio. Je Jeff again um, does all his own stuff, but but Jeff is very much somebody who um, loves spaces and and doesn't want to use technology to create spaces. Um, it's two ways of looking at it, but Jeff is all about the, the drums and the sounds of the guitars and everything within the space that is a live space. So that's where going to an Abbey Road or um, one of these other big, great studios is important. It's to create a certain sound for drums, particularly, or, or a string section um, within a space. And that is the only way I use it. Um, as I say, Jeff uses it all the time. I mean, Jeff's a big believer in the environment with the records he makes. And he won't use, um, he doesn't use reverb, uh, made reverb. So, you know, it's um, one of the big things when we, when we first, start, first started touring with him was the first thing he said to me is, make sure there's no reverb anywhere. And I was like, oh, right, what, what do you mean? And he, and he went, no, no reverb. I mean, no reverb. I wasn't joking. And so we had to go to all the um, instruments, keyboards, and remove all the reverb. Um, and... It, you know, it's a it's, it's a completely different way of looking at things, but he, he's the the king of the the space and what sure. the sound of the room brings, and um, how that works um, within uh, you know the environment of recording. I you know I I do I do kind of the opposite to that, but I I totally get what what he's talking about, and to the point where. If I need a sound of a certain thing, you know, which requires a room, that's when I'll go elsewhere. Right, right. So talking about that creative process, that you know, obviously Jeff's got his his own way of uh, doing things. You know, he doesn't like the reverb element, and he wants it, you know, to use the room. Well, like you say, yeah, it's it's it's, it's not he doesn't like reverb. He doesn't like um, created reverb, manufactured reverb. He only likes real reverb. So it would. You know, he'll go to a church to get a church reverb. He won't do it out of a machine. Right. OK, well, we've got an interesting question coming back to take that. <laughs> Paul um, has asked, um, what is your approach when you create the take that tours? Because obviously yeah. one thing that we did, we, we you know, we need to kind of touch on is the fact that the take that tours were arena tours and now they're stadium yeah. tours. And I remember the day, you know, Gary turned around to you and said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we played Wembley Stadium one day? Yeah. And, you know, well, it was like, hang on a minute, they already are. We've got this bayer yeah. mouth of a take that tour. Um, they, he says, they always deliver dramatic excitement, energy and euphoric feeling when you're in the crowd. Um, and by the way, it's fantastic. And your backing band is fab. <laughs> so what's your approach when creating a take that tour? Well, you know something, the t a lot of the take that tour comes from the guys in terms of, what they want to create. They're very creative, those lads. Um, and I, I generally would work on, on, and also they have a, a creative director called Kim Gavin, who's very much a part of, of their look and, and the sound. It's a collective. They will come together with a, a specific set of songs they want to use, they want to work with, and then th how we will join those things together to, with the staging of the whole thing as well. And really my job is to then turn that creatively into <clears throat> what you hear when you're there. And, and we use a number of, uh, of, of techniques of doing things. I mean, it, it's a very involved process, take that. It involves, it's, it's, you know, every night doing a show, you could set your watch by the chord you're playing. You know, you know when you're going to, because it's very, very much a creative and put together thing. Within the, the what happens within the, so we'll have the songs, and 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 I may work out ways of getting from one song to another, or within the song, the songs are very much the way they are. Although we do have a certain amount of 
freedom to play with more of a live feel, but we keep pretty strictly to the way the records are. We just try and make it bigger and more exciting. And, but that happens naturally with musicians playing music anyway. And then within a production, so we'll have production weeks, a couple of weeks of production where we're working with Kim and the guys. And that's where creatively things may change. Let's try this. Let's try the other. And uh, we will work within that framework. It can be pretty full on doing that. Um, uh, uh, but it's an exciting process. And, and, and really, it's about bringing an energy for me bringing an energy to the music, which is really important with Take That. So my musicians and the, the way we approach it is very full on. You know, we, we don't hold back. We, we put a lot into the performance in terms of emotional content, the way it's played, the way it's um, heard. We look at the sounds. We go into detail with the sounds we're making and how you know, they balance properly. We work with our front of house engineer. I work with the front of house engineer a lot. You know, with the take that to the detail and the amount of work that goes in is, you know, a lot more than a, a lot of other tours. But it's, it's we're, we're trying to create a different thing. You know, if you're on a, an ELO tour, the songs do the, you know, you're still playing it the right way, but the songs, you know, are the, the main thing. With take that, it's the whole package, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the marrying of the sound, the, the music, the visuals, making it all work. And, and I have to say with, with Take That, a lot of creativity comes from them, you know, um, very, very much the, the three, used to be four, used to be five, but um, the three of them work, work at it, take it very seriously, and they're tireless to get it as good as possible. You know, the pressure is always there to be as good and better than the last time. But the whole team of people, you know, works tirelessly on that. I'm exhausted at the end of it. Take that. The, the best thing for me is when we finally get out there and play it because I'm so exhausted by the time we get to the first gig. It's just like the gig's easy. Yeah. <laughs> the gig's the simple bit. <laughs> right. Right, we've got a couple of minutes left, Mike. Um, one of the things I do want to touch on, um, just to give you an opportunity, I believe you've been working on um, some recent solo stuff, um, which yeah. hopefully should be out in the near future. Um, tell us, just yeah. a, you've got a couple of minutes, just tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, lockdown and all the rest of it, not being away on tour for months and everything on, on end. You know, I did want to revisit my sax stuff. You know, in Take That show, I, I play a big solo called Million Love Songs, which is a big saxophone solo so a lot of the fans and people know me for doing that it's not just the the MDing side they, they recognize that and you know I, I've had three solo albums back in the day I've had a uh, various ideas and it just seemed like an obvious time to try and do something so I've been putting together a lot of stuff which I hope to put out at some stage don't know how don't know when you know see if the the fans or anybody would be interested in that um, I've, I've been doing a, a lot of work on it. Maybe, you know, I'd like to get some people in to do a bit of singing on it and stuff. It's, it's still in development, but um, I, I've certainly had the inspiration to, to do it recently. And, and um, so I've been working on that. Watch this space. Um, and you never know. Maybe something will come out again. I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to tour it because of coronavirus, but there yeah. you go. <laughs> I'll have to do it remotely from my studio <laughs> well uh, considering how this is is gone i think you that could be quite feasible to do that um well i'm up for it <laughs> yeah well look mike i think we could probably go on for another hour but i think you know we, we maybe what we'll do is we'll come back for round two at some point anytime in the near yeah. anytime um, but thank you so much for your time this afternoon um Thanks Absolute for hearing pleasure. all your stories. I know everyone's enjoyed it. We've had some fantastic comments and feedback. Um, and to everybody watching, thank you for watching. Um, stay safe wherever you are. Don't forget to mask up. Um, and take care and hopefully see you again soon. And thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Jody. And uh, I'm so glad you did so well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Take care now. Bye-bye.